So earlier this week, I turned 42. Thursday was my birthday. And while it's true that I get to pick what I want to talk about every single Sunday at the pulpit, I always tend to regard that annual milestone as this time of kind of self-reflection. And I have a tendency to reveal in these mid-August sermons a little bit of what's going on in my mind. So if that's indulgent, so be it. <laughs> there are a limitless number of places where I could begin this sermon, but I want to start by sharing a memory from childhood. Growing up, both my parents were high school teachers, and the highlight of every summer was, or of many summers, was a camping trip to a national park. One year, we were lucky enough to go to Yosemite, one of the most iconic of our nation's national parks. And on the way to the park, I busied myself by studying a guidebook of Yosemite's trails. And it was in doing so that I came to discover that Yosemite National Park contains more than 800 miles of hiking trails, and that as a family, we were planning to hike perhaps eight, maybe as many as 18 of those 800 miles, a small, minuscule fraction of the total. And to tell you the truth, even though, even though the hikes we would take during those few days and the sights we would see, they were breathtaking and exhilarating, there was also a part of me, telling you the truth here, there was a part of me that was a little sad because I would not get to experience the other 782 miles. And I fear that there might be something on those trails that I would miss. And inside of my barely teenage self, there was an inner dialogue, a familiar inner dialogue taking place. One reassuring voice told me, you know, self, if you so desire, you could probably make it your life goal to hike all 800 miles. You'd probably succeed. And that reassurance was then countered by the other voice that said, but if you did that, what other experiences would you miss? I pray that I'm not the only one that thinks this way. <laughs> Has anyone else ever had this inner conversation with themselves? There's actually a, a word, actually an acronym, that has become very popular among the generation younger than me. The word is FOMO. And I'm going to ask, so say, say it with me, FOMO. FOMO. Now, who has ever heard of FOMO before? Well, wow, more than the first service. <laughs> so FOMO, it's an acronym. It stands for Fear of Missing Out. Fear of missing out. Not fear as in fright, not fear as in terror, more like a kind of existential dread that there is something happening somewhere that you are missing and that you will have to live with the regret that you missed it. <laughs> Be honest with me, is this a feeling that you've ever experienced? I think it perfectly nails the experience I had with the map of Yosemite National Park, the feeling that I relate to. But I wonder if FOMO is more than common millennial slang. I wonder if it isn't also a theological concept. The prolific and, if truth be told, polarizing Unitarian Universalist minister Forrest Church offered the following definition of religion. Religion, he said, is our human response to being alive and having to die. 
religion is our human response to being alive and having to die. I've never been actually completely satisfied with that definition, though. I've always wanted to gently edit it, which is to say to make it worse. <laughs> religion, I say, is our human response to being finite beings. In a universe that is essentially infinite, religion is our human response to being limited. In a world that is limitless beyond our imagining. That we are finite and limited is indisputable. I've heard repeatedly over the past several weeks wonderful and heartwarming words of praise for one of our summer preaching practicum sermons, the one that Amy Glazier gave, in which she shared the awe-inspiring and amazing image of us as finite beings connected intimately with the near-infiniteness of time and space. In fact, it was thinking of Amy that I decided to put the, the cover art that I did on the order of service. And, and in this service, I've, I've tried, and Glenn and I have worked together to choose music and hymns and readings and words that evoke this sense of limitlessness. That's a picture, by the way, of the Milky Way, and you may be interested to know that it was way back in, I think, about the 1950s or so that an experimental minister in Boston named Ken Patton, experimental Unitarian minister in Ken Patton, developed a new church, and when he, when he built it, he actually made the artwork on the chancel a picture of the Milky Way, and so worshipers, when they came in every Sunday, would see in front of them a picture of our galaxy, and that was meant to elicit a sense of the limitlessness of the universe and our own limitedness. We are small, finite, and limited, not just in comparison to stars and galaxies and black holes, but in comparison to this world. There are more than 7 billion people in this world you will never meet. Together, we will never climb 99% of the world's mountains. Most of us, all of us, will never visit most of the amazing places in the world. There are libraries upon libraries upon libraries full of amazing books that none of us will ever read. The world is alive with languages none of us will ever understand. And I hate to break it to you, but you will never play point guard for the Tar Heels. <laughs> and if by some miracle, the guard, the starting point guard of the Tar Heels happened to show up right here in church this morning, I would have to look at her or him and say how sorry I was for the limited nature of their lives having to go through life and never serving as the minister of the community <laughs> church. <It's> like, <laughs> what a limited life. <laughs> have, have we ever reflected on the limitedness of life. Not only our own, but of every life. For we each partake of one seven billion of the total. Since it's the Sunday closest to my birthday, I'm going to be a little indulgent and talk about a favorite piece of writing of mine. This piece of writing is a, is a long-form essay by David Foster Wallace. And the, the setting of it is that he spends, David Foster Wallace, he spends a week on a cruise ship and writes kind of his dispatches of that experience. The title of the essay, A Supposedly Fun Thing I'll Never Do Again. <laughs> and and I've, I've never been on a cruise ship. I've never had that experience. So I can't uh, say whether it's true or not. But, but I found his essay riveting. And there are two parts of this essay that have always struck with me, stuck with me. The first part is when David Foster Wallace observes his 
cruise ship, perhaps approaching port, come up alongside another cruise ship so that the two ships pass. And when this happens, the author observes people on both ships heading to the side and kind of eyeballing the other ship and visibly comparing the amenities on their own ship to the amenities on the other ship. And the author overhears his fellow passengers asking questions like, does that ship have some luxury that mine does not have? Are the pools bigger? Are the cabins roomier? Is there some spectacular feature they are enjoying which I am not? And this seems to be a metaphor for so much in life, right? To be on an immense floating vessel full of possibilities for enjoyment, excess if we're being honest, and to look away, to, to wonder whether the people on that other vessel are, are somehow having more enjoyment than you happen to be at the moment. It's the definition of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Existential unease with the limits of our own life. In the second part of the David Foster Wallace essay that's always stayed with me is a quote about the limitations that we encounter as human beings. It's a quote that's, that's struck with me, for, stuck with me for, for more than a decade. And some people find it depressing. I actually find it liberating and optimistic, but allow me the indulgence of reading it to you. For David Foster Wallace writes in this essay, I am now 33 years old, and it feels like much time has passed and is passing faster and faster every day. Day to day, I have to make all sorts of choices about what is good and important. And then I have to live with the forfeiture of all the other options those choices foreclose. And I'm starting to see how as time gains momentum, my choices will narrow and their foreclosures multiply exponentially until I arrive at some point on some branch of all life's sumptuous branching complexity at which I am finally locked in and stuck on one path. And time speeds me through stages of stasis and atrophy and decay until I go down for the third time, all struggle for not drowned by time, it is dreadful. But since it is my own choices that will lock me in, it seems unavoidable. If I want to be any kind of grown-up, I will have to make choices and regret foreclosures and try my best to live with them. I've never heard that as liberating. Maybe that's just me. There is a question of how we ought to respond to the fact of our own limitedness, what spiritual practices, what spiritual disciplines serve us well in responding to our own limitations. I believe that some of those spiritual practices include practicing gratitude for what is, cultivating humility for the limits of our own perspectives and experiences, practicing acceptance for what we cannot control, and doing the work of being present, allowing ourselves to be fully in the present moment. At this point, though, I want to shift the sermon. I want to shift gears from my preteen fear of missing out on 782 miles of hiking trails in Yosemite and shift gear from David Foster Wallace's observation that our life will only be but one branch on the infinite tree of life's sumptuous branching complexity. So far, I've only spoken of finitude and limitedness. But now I want to speak about the other, the limitless. 
If religion, with apologies to Forest Church, is our human response to being limited in a universe that is by all measures limitless, then we might ask ourselves about that limitless part. Early in his career, among the very first of his more than two dozen books, Forest Church published a slim volume entitled God and Other Famous Liberals. <laughs> and in it, he wrote the following. I love this quote. Who is the most famous liberal of all time? It simply has to be God. No one is more generous, bounteous, or misunderstood, not to mention profligate. Take a look at creation. God is a lavish and indiscriminate host. There is too much of everything. Creatures, cultures, languages, stars, more galaxies than we can count, more stars in the heavens than grains of sand on earth. Every word I conjure for God, the church continues, every word I conjure for God is a synonym for liberal. God is munificent and open-handed. The creation is exuberant, lavish, even prodigal. Liberal images such as these also characterize the spirit, if not always the letter of the Bible, which teaches us that God is love. I love that quote so much. I can hardly imagine a religion that doesn't conceive and speak about the limitless, the infinite, the beyond. Some religions imagine God and other divine beings that are held to be all-powerful or all-knowing, that are able to transcend the limitations that all of us mere mortals experience. Gods who are held to be eternal and beyond time. Liberal religion, though, has a particular way of approaching the limitless. Liberal religion sees the limitlessness of our world as inherently good, as a cause for celebration, and as an invitation to explore, to savor. Liberal religion is all about claiming a broad diversity of spiritual sources, texts and scriptures and philosophies and poems and art and nature beyond limit. We're all about praising the amazing diversity of the world, its people, its cultures, its art, its ecosystems, its biodiversity. These are good, they are very good and worthy of our praise, and they compel us to acts of respect and honor and stewardship. We feel moved, perhaps, by the words of the mystic poet William Blake, who wrote, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. And yes, we are perhaps urged urge to take this moment, this particular limited moment, and see it as holding the seeds of the infinite. To admit that while there is an infiniteness and a limitlessness around us that we can only ever know in small part, we may still strive to recognize the whole and to praise it. And I'd like to go one step further and say that liberal religion not only asks us to recognize the limitlessness of the world, it not only asks us to praise this limitlessness as good, but it also asks us to question and to challenge and to work against arbitrary and cruel limits that we encounter in our living. To ask questions such as, why should rights be limited to one group? 
to one gender or one race or one sexual orientation. To be uncomfortable with limitedness and to ask for the limitless. To ask, why should education be limited to those with wealth? And to work against that limit. Why should health care be limited to those with wealth? Why should borders and walls exist? Why should there be hungry children in our town? You're called to recognize a world that is not inherently limited. And to imagine the limitless. And to recognize that these limits are perverse are perverse if we are really able to imagine and recognize the limitlessness of all that is. Religion is our human response to the limits we encounter and the reality of a larger limitlessness of which we are a part. And so I ask you this morning to think to yourself, what limits are there in your life right now that you find yourself chafing against? What limits are difficult for you? What's bringing up for you that, that sense of fear of missing out? And what are you doing with that? Are you changing? Are you practicing? be able to hold it. And amidst all of these limits that you and I may encounter, where is it that you perceive limitlessness? And how does it beckon you forth in your living and your life? Amen. And blessed be. I invite us to sing our closing hymn of the morning. It is uh, one of the hymns that uh, evoked a sense of the limitless to me. It's a beautiful hymn called I Brought My Spirit to the Sea. It's number four, and I invite you to rise in body or in spirit.